In this second course, what I want to go over is how you simulate uh, epidemiological models. And again, I mean, this is the introductory week for the course, so I'm not going to go into uh, enormous amounts of detail, but I'm still going to give you a few leads as to what you could do. Um, so, and as a word of warning, I will be using the R language and I'll come back to that in a, in a while. I mean, there are other options, of course, but this is the language I'm the most familiar with now. And uh, that's the one I'm going to use for this demonstration. Um, I'll point out that there are other very uh, good ways of doing things. Okay. But uh, so what I'll do is give you a very brief crash introduction to R. Then I'll say a few words about programming in R, dealing with data, solving ODEs numerically. And I should have added to this solving continuous time Markov chains numerically as well, because that's an important part of this course. So I will edit the slides to add this. Um, so to begin with, uh, let's talk about the R language and more generally uh, other solutions for scientific computing. And I'm just going to um, say a few words there, but I, I'll, I'll point out that R, one of the reasons I like it uh, is that although it's originally a language for stats and it's sort of the perception uh, that people have of this language is as a language for statistics, um, it is now much more than that, okay? And uh, I think it's important to bear that in mind. So it's to begin, uh, this is an open source version of a, another language called S uh, and R appeared in 1993. So it's quite a mature language. It's almost 30 years old. Um, it's now in version 4.2. And one thing that I like, and I, I should point out, I will say a lot of things that are true about R, but that are also true of Python. Uh, one thing that I quite like is that it relies heavily on a code base that is written in C and Fortran. So for instance, one package that I'm going to uh, show you today how to use is called DE solve for ordinary differential equation solve. And that package is actually entirely written in Fortran. And it's a for, it's a it's an R interface to a set of Fortran function that have existed since the late 70s. So these are tried and proved numerical methods that are sort of packaged in a way that they can be used from within the R language. But the entire code base for DE solve is Fortran and a bit of C. Uh, so this makes it a very quick and uh, robust package. And uh, as I said, I mean, a lot of the remarks are relative to Python as well, uh, but this is a very active community you will find a lot of solutions. And when I'll, I'll come back to that later, when you're choosing a programming language, that's something to bear in mind. In terms of development environments for R, uh, there's a terminal version that is not super friendly. There's a slightly nicer terminal called Radian, uh, which, uh, and as before, all of my slides are uh, clickable. Uh, so that would take you there. Uh, you can, although this is not a friendly way of doing things, you can execute R scripts by running this command, R script, name of the R script. This is very useful for automating code, for instance. If you have code that you need to run, for example, to refresh data daily or for some reason like this, then that would be a very good way to run things. Uh, you can also use integrated development environments and the most well known uh, for several years now has been R Studio, which is a great development environment. And I might say a few words about this later, but for now let's skip on this. RK Ward would be what you would choose if you're using an ARM, an ARM uh, processor. So for example, I do a lot of stuff with Raspberry Pis or Chromebooks 
and uh, oftentimes your processor is ARM, when RStudio is not uh, distributed as a compiled uh, interface on ARM. And so you have to compile it from sources, which takes an extremely long time on a small Raspberry Pi. Uh, and so in the end, you end up using RK Ward. And one uh, thing that I will mention is that it also integrates with, R, uh, with uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And I will show you a brief example of doing this. Uh, there's also, if you want to go a bit further, uh, there is some code uh, in the code directory for my course uh, that uses, for example, Shiny. Shiny is a very cool interface. Uh, it's a sort of addition to our studio, which allows you to run R from within a website. And uh, I have some code that I'll uh, share. Uh, where I'm running uh, a Shiny uh, server. That is, it's R and Shiny running on a server, and uh, you can uh, display the results of this. Okay. R Markdown is also a very interesting thing to learn. It's a Markdown that incorporates R commands. Uh, and it's really useful to, for generating reports in HTML or PDF. Uh, it can make slides. I have done that in the past. I'm not doing it so much right now, but this is a good way of automatizing a process such as creating a weekly report on data that changes. And again, there is, I believe, an example of R Markdown in the code uh, directory for, the, uh, for my um, the repo for this course. Uh, and R Sweeve is a bit like R Markdown. Uh, it's LaTeX incorporating R commands. It's really good if you're generating something in LaTeX. Uh, it's gone a little bit less uh, prominent now because of R Markdown, which allows to do essentially the same thing. If you want to make elaborate LaTeX, it's probably better to use R Sweeve, but um, that's it. Now, R is a scripted language. So it's an interactive language. It means you can, when you run R in a terminal, uh, you get an R environment in which the commands can be run one after the other. It's not uh, compiled. I mean, you can pre-compile some uh, files in order for them to run faster, but the, the norm is not for a pre-compiled uh, pre execution. It is interactive. Uh, so this is very good but I will uh, issue a word of warning, which is that if you do this and you do not pay attention to the fact that the memory in a scripted language like this, what you do while you're playing around with your data is kept in memory. And so it's also often a good idea, I always advocate for this, to run your script using our script the same way I was saying before here, this, this option of running the script. Because when you do so, all that is in memory is what is in memory when you start running your script. And it happens often that, for example, I don't know, you, you compute a transformation of a matrix and you compute your results using this transformation. Well, if you haven't put this in the script, the next time you run it, that transformation will not be computed. So it's really a good idea from time to time to run things from scratch using an R script. Uh, I'll point out that uh, there's also Python and it's also scripted. It's a very good language as well. I personally, I'm not a fan. Uh, there are some things that annoy me in the Python language. I mean, one thing is that Python requires you to indent your code, which I think is a very I mean, their argument for saying, oh, if, 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 if it's not indented, it doesn't run. Well, I don't know anybody who does programming uh, sort of seriously and does not indent their code. So that is a bad, in, bad view. Uh, and uh, I 
also, I mean, I've run into problems when I switch between Unix and Windows that don't do indentation the same way, for example. And also one thing that annoys me is that they mix a lot of functional approaches and object-oriented approaches. But again, uh, there are some people doing absolutely fantastic code in Python, and it's also a good language. Uh, it is a good solution. It's just one that I'm not uh, really keen on. Uh, another option is CCG and uh, well, Jupyter Notebooks uh, and CCG. And let me let me point spend a minute on this because I think it's an important uh, side note. Um, you can run R or Python or Julia, as a matter of fact, which is another uh, scientific computing language, within what's called the Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter. Uh, Jupyter also has Jupyter Labs, which is much more like R Studio, and Voila, which is much more like CCG. Uh, not CCG, sorry, <laughs> uh, like uh, Shiny. Uh, so these cover essentially the same thing as R Markdown, that's for notebooks, uh, R Studio, that's Labs, and Voila, which is Shiny. And one thing that's very important, interesting for you, if you're registered in one of those universities in Canada, uh, the list is relatively long, uh, is that you have access to a platform that implements our um, Jupyter Notebooks natively. So let me just show you what happens. I hope this is showing this. Um, Yes, this is showing this. Uh, so this is what happens when you go to ccg.ca. Uh, the link is there. You can, for example, here I'm at the University of Manitoba, so I'll choose Manitoba. It takes me to my login uh, system. I log in and I end up with, uh, at some point, uh, I will get a Jupyter Notebook. Um, so this is a Jupyter Hub. And then what you have is, uh, let me show you an example with a, a class that I'm currently teaching, uh, Math of Data Science. And here I was showing my students how to use, uh, let me see, where have I got this, uh, SVB for image uh, compression. And you can see that what I have here is a notebook that includes some uh, markdown uh, windows where uh, cell blocks and some R cell blocks and if I run this it allows me to run some uh, so here I'm doing an example where I'm uh, using the uh, singular value decomposition to compress an image so let me just uh, run everything um, just for illustration so here I'm doing my my SVB uh, and I'm here at the end and so here I'm compressing, but I'm using the 100 singular value. Let me show you uh, just as an example what happens when you have less singular values. I'm not going to detail this. This is like a linear algebra application uh, problem. Uh, but you can see that this runs R. Uh, and at the top here, not seeable in my window, is a little R. Uh, you could also have Python or Julia in there, and it would work as well. And again, this is a, this is a facility uh, that is uh, provided by Compute Canada. And that is free to you if you're in one of those universities. What it will do when you connect is it will use your login from your university as a single login, so you don't have to create an account. It will link to your account and you have access to this facility. And I mean, the processors you'll get access to are not fantastic. Uh, I think you're limited to one gigabyte of storage space, but it is a very good place to start running some code if you want. And let me, I uh, need to reactivate this. Yes. Uh, so this is, I think, a very good option. Uh, there are other solutions, of course, one that I didn't put here that I should have put because it's dev it was originally developed by the lab in which I did my PhD. It's called Scilab. 
uh, which is a scientific uh, computation uh, language. Um, so there's Julia that I already mentioned, which is a programming language, Octave, which is MATLAB's uh, uh, open source cousin, Maxima, which is good for symbolic computation, Sage Math, that essentially tries to bridge all of the above, Julia, Python, R, Maxima, uh, Octave, etc. Um, and of course, there's a lot of paying stuff, but personally, I only use open source uh, programs. That's why I use R or Python and not MATLAB. And if I were using MATLAB, I would use Octave, not MATLAB. Uh, but that's a personal choice. Um, that's it. Uh, and uh, one last thing about programming languages, it's what I was mentioning earlier, if you have a choice, because oftentimes you'll be working with someone who will impose their view on you or something like this, but if you do have a choice, uh, then I always recommend to students to perform a stack overflow or a test. Essentially, uh, search for the, the language name between square brackets. So for example, Python, R, and so on. And this will give you in Stack Overflow how many questions were asked where the author of the question put this code uh, to say this is relative to Python, this is relative to R. You, For example, LaTeX is also very popular there. I'm not discussing it here. But so for instance, as of a couple of days ago, if you look at Python, there's 2 million questions that have been asked on the platform. R is almost 500,000. Julia is 11,000. So it's a much lower. Octave is 5,000. But Octave is essentially compatible with MATLAB. And MATLAB has about 100,000 questions. Sage, for example, is by many respects, a very good language. I mean, I, I like what Sage is doing, but at the same time, if you launch yourself into Sage, you have to be aware that there are very few questions that have been answered about that language. So unless you have someone around who knows Sage well and is able to help you, this is probably not a good language to decide on at the beginning. Now, let's look at programming in R. So very briefly, uh, first of all, a lot of you will come from the MATLAB world. So if, if you come from MATLAB, it's very similar to MATLAB. And of course, there are differences because otherwise, where would the fun be? Uh, and one of the main differences is if you're used to MATLAB, every line finishes with a semicolon in MATLAB. In R, there's no semicolon to finish lines. Well, it's one of the many differences between the two. The comments are not the same, and etc. So I'm going to really give you, as I said, this is a crash course. Uh, so there's two ways to assign values to variables. Uh, there's this uh, essentially algorithmic uh, language way of writing. So to x, I attribute the value 10 or there is the more common x equals 10. Both result in assigning the value 10 to the variable x. I'll point out that uh, our purists uh, tend to prefer the first version. Uh, I don't really care, uh, but it is something to know. And essentially, when you see my slides, uh, in my upcoming slides, uh, one thing is if, if I'm using that equality, it's probably things I wrote and others might be things that I stole off the web, although I wrote all of this and I used equality uh, assignation uh, that way. Uh, so that's another uh, important uh, concept to learn because in R, uh, that's one of the most used data structures. It's the so-called lists. Uh, so if you're used to MATLAB, in MATLAB you would use uh, structures, like where you put a, a dot after a value to say that there is a substructure in there. Uh, in R, it's lists. And lists are great because you can just store things in them and you don't have to remember the order. You know, like very uh, many times I have students who are programming and they make a vector of parameters. 
which is great, but the problem is that you have to remember in what order you're giving your parameters. A list has the advantage that I can name a list element. So this creates an empty list. And then here I'm saying there's an element called A and you access it with a dollar sign to which I attribute the value 10. There's an element called B to which I give the value three. And there's an element that I give another name to which I attribute the value proof proof. It's a classic uh, French uh, silliness. Uh, <clears throat> and then I can say, what is the first element in the list? And that will be the first one that I entered. You see that there's a single uh, square bracket here. Or I can say, what is the second element? In this case, with two square brackets, it returns um, the value of three. You see that before, when I used a single bracket, it gave me the name as well. Here, I'm using the double brackets, double square brackets, and it just gives me the content. I can also say dollar $A to access the value dollar $A. I can uh, use B as a placeholder, and you will see in my code, uh, there's a lot of code that I, not a lot, but there's a few uh, pieces of code that I've put in the uh, GitHub repo, and if you use it, you will see I use lists all the time. They're very convenient. Uh, this is another way. I call this another name so I can use it like this. So, right. Vectors uh, work very much the same way as they do in MATLAB. So if you've ever done some MATLAB, this is exactly the same way as you cr would create the vector with the first 10 uh, integers. Uh, it's exactly the same in MATLAB, except that it would have a semicolon at the end of this line. You can also use the C operator, concatenation. Uh, and if I do C of x, which is this vector that I've already created, and 12, this puts together this vector and 12. Okay, I can concatenate red and blue, uh, and then I can do this. And here, just as a remark, when you're doing vectors, not lists, all your elements are the same type. So here, for instance, I've defined 1 to 10 implicitly as integers. Uh, so that number that I'm adding is a number. Here I've put in Z uh, red and blue as strings of uh, characters, okay, uh, chains of characters. And before, because of that, when I add one, it says that one is a string, not a number. So this is something to bear in mind sometimes when you're doing things. Uh, matrices, you can define uh, using mat or vec that will make a matrix of zeros uh, with here two rows and three columns. So this would give you a two by three uh, matrix of zeros. You can also prescribe the value of the entries. In this case, you use matrix as your keyword and you list the entries. And just a remark, the like in MATLAB, actually, uh, matrix entries are listed by columns. So if I make the matrix with one, two, three, four, I say there's two rows and two columns, I get the matrix one, two, three, four. Oftentimes, uh, when we're doing work, we're thinking more along the lines of uh, something by uh, where we uh, specify the entries by rows. And I would do that by just specifying that I'm entering things by rows. Okay, this just means this option of the, the function to sort things by row is equal to true. That means do it by row. Okay, and in this case, I get the matrix one, two, three, four. Um, one thing with matrix uh, multiplication in R, which is very weird compared to what I know in other languages, uh, is that when you use this notation, the star, just star, uh, what you get is the Adamar product. Uh, so for instance, in MATLAB, that would be denoted dot star. And if you remember, that means your matrices have to have the same size, exactly. They don't have to be compatible for multiplication. They have to have the same size. And what you then get is the product by product uh, uh, entry by entry product matrix, okay, the so called Adamar matrix, uh, a product. Uh, so it's not standard matrix multiplication. 
And that's a source of error because most of the time you're working with square matrices and therefore you forget that uh, you're taking an atom or product. The regular matrix product is taken by surrounding the star with percentage signs on each side. And that will bring a remark if you come from the MATLAB world, percentage is a comment. Uh, in R, comments are hash. Uh, and percentages have different values. Uh, vector operations, same as MATLAB typically. The only thing is be aware that implicitly uh, R is friendly and at the same time this is a source of error. If I have a vector X defined as I have at the top here and then I write X plus 1, what it does is it adds a vector of 1s to X. So I end up with everything shifted one by uh, well shifted by one, uh, and this is extremely annoying sometimes. So you have to be careful uh, whether you want to uh, shift things by one or more, uh, or if you just want to add an element, or for instance, if you're looking at the positions, do you want to look at the eleventh position? But if you're doing this, you're not getting the eleventh position. You're just shifting everything by one. Um, or if you come from MATLAB, there's a magic keyword in MATLAB, uh, which is end, which gives you the last row or the last column in a matrix. Or uh, if you go end, end gives you the last position in the matrix. We don't have that in R, so you'll have to use length for a list or for vectors, n car for character chains, dimension for matrices which is going to return two values. This is a little annoying, but I mean, you get used to it and um, eventually you don't have too much problems with this. Flow control is very similar to other languages. Uh, if a condition is true, so what is in here must evaluate to a true value, true or false. So for example, if X is less than three, uh, that evaluates to a truth value, then you put a list of stuff to do. Uh, what's important is that it's good to keep in mind to use the opening brackets and closing brackets, uh, curly braces, uh, to separate what is happening within your code and indent it. Uh, so even if there's a single instruction, typically it understands that you don't need these uh brackets but it's best to do it so and you can have an if and else so if i want to do an if else if else uh i can have as many of those as i want all loops uh are quite flexible uh, typically they go for some variable in some set and it works by sets so for instance, when I say for i in 1 to 10, this takes i with values in the integers from 1 to 10. If I say for j in this vector, it takes values there. But if I say for something in this list, uh, well, vector of, uh, of characters, so n is then going to be truc, then muj, then chose, etc. And you can also iterate on a list. So you, you can get into some pretty complex uh, things. Um, L apply is something that I extremely strongly recommend learning how to use because L apply is one of the most beautiful uh, constructs and it has a fantastic application which is that once you've learned how to L apply, you can par L apply, which allows you to parallel apply the same thing. Okay, and I'll have an example for you of that. So for instance, I can do, um, let me make a list, and that list has for i entry, this is, R unif is uh, create I, uniformly distributed numbers, uh, if you don't specify, it's between 0 and 1. 
Okay, so if I do this, the first element in my list has one random number between 0 and 1, the second has two random numbers between 0 and 1, the third one has three, and so on and so forth, then I can say, apply to this list L that I've just chosen, the function mean. And so what this is going to do, it's going to go down my list L, and it's going to use the function mean on each of the elements of the list. So that first one will have just one entry, the second one will have two, and so on and so forth. And I can easily use the function mean to all of these things. It doesn't matter that they have different lengths. I could compute the sum of the vector, for example. I could do a lot of things very easily. Okay. Uh, if you want to make it a, a vector, you could say unlist because the result of using L apply is a list of the same length, which contains the result of using the function on each element of the list. So the first entry in your result list is L to which you've applied mean, the second entry is L to which you've applied mean, but L of 2, etc. So you can unlist, that's a very common command. Uh, in R, which just removes listings. Uh, or you could also do uh, this, which is just do S apply. Uh, so it's uh, the same uh, category of functions. And in that case, you would get a vector. And apply can be quite complex, and you will see examples in the code that I've posted if you end up using it, where I've used L apply in sort of more elaborate ways. So for instance, you can use and apply to pick up non-trivial list entries. So suppose I make a list where each list entry is in turn a list. And that's going to happen, for example, if I have a model and I want to consider two different versions of the model with two different versions of the parameters. Well, I'm going to say model version one. I'm going to make a list of parameters for model version one and model version two. I'll make a list of parameters for model version two. Okay, and so here each list element is a list, and in each one I'm putting a that is uh, those uniform numbers, uh, uniformly distributed uh, random numbers between zero and one. I take i of them, and in b I take two i of them. Well, I could, for instance, say let me s apply, so make a vector uh, result right away to the list L. I should have used a capital L in my example to make it more clear. Maybe I'll edit my code. Uh, and what I'm doing is here, instead of using the standard function, I'm using a function that I make myself, a very small function, okay, a very simple function. And that function takes x and returns length of the B, so X is then going to be a list entry, so L of 1, L of 2, etc. And what this is doing is it's returning the length of XB, which is that guy. Okay, so here I should have, the first entry should have 2, the second entry should have 4, and you can see that indeed when I apply the function, this is what I get. Um, let me show you an example. Uh, this is something uh, that will end up when you're doing sensitivity analysis uh, or parameter exploration. You want to look at a bunch of values of parameters. There's a very nice way of doing things is to uh, use this construct here. So here, for instance, I'm saying I'm going to make variations for my parameters. Uh, let's say I have three parameters. Uh, I'm going to make some variations. I'm going to say that the first parameter is going to vary sequentially. Okay, it's a sequence from 1 to 10. And I want 10 values. Okay, length out says I want 10 values for that interval. Uh, here, I'm going to take a sequence from 0 to 1 and also 10 values. And here a sequence from minus one to one and 10 values. So every time it's going to compute the relevant uh, step so that you have 10 values uh, where you ask for 10 values or whatever. And then you have those variations. And then what you can create is uh, use this function expand grid. What it does 
is it creates a matrix that has as many row uh, columns, sorry, as there are parameters. So this matrix would have a, a column P1, a column P2, and a column P3. And then it takes every single possible combination of the parameter of the values in each of these uh, vectors. Okay, so you are going to end up, so there's 10 values here each. So you're going to end up here with a matrix with a thousand rows. And each of those rows will have a different combination of the parameters. So we still have to make it into a list. At some point, you do have to use a for loop, for example. But see the advantage of this. If I have an enormous parameter range that I want to compute, well, once I've made this list that contains all the parameters, the different parameter values, uh, I, can, I can split this list. If I have two computers, I can split the list between the two computers and get one of the computers to run half of the list and the other computer to run the other half. Or I can do a lot of things like this. So this allows me to distribute my work between computers. Okay. And as I said, you can use parallel applied. And at the end of this course, I hope I will have persuaded you that parallel apply is a good thing, but we'll get to that. Uh, now, let me very briefly talk about data. Uh, so there's a paper that I published a few, uh, just at the beginning of the pandemic, actually, I published it just like in January 2020, uh, where I explain this type of idea. And there's a GitHub for the paper uh, that has a different version of the, uh, the paper, which is probably more usable because you can copy and paste from the paper in the GitHub repo. But the publishers did a very bad job with the paper itself. Um, get into details here, but uh, so if you are interested in the type of ideas that I discuss here, I recommend you to see the repo. Um, the the whole idea that I'm going to uh, to discuss for a minute or two here is that as a modeler, and this whole course is about modeling, uh, I think it's important to be data aware. Uh, so it is extremely easy to get data from the web and not all data is available okay uh, so in in the one health uh, perspective of this course some of the data is held by uh, organizations that are not going to give you access that easily but there is a degree of data that you can access uh, and i think given that fact it's really important to do that to actually access the data when you have access to it and that's part of the open data uh, sort of movement which is that governments and organizations uh, have a tendency more and more to put as much data as possible uh, on the web provided it's anonymized and you know, like you can't find people information from the data but that's a very uh, important sort of evolution in the past 10 to 15 years, and especially since the beginning of COVID, uh, that I think as public health people, uh, we have to take into account. Okay. So don't, don't be overwhelmed by data. Don't, be, uh, don't feel that you have to use data in absolutely every process. But I think it's important that your work be grounded in uh, some level of data awareness. Um, just to explain, uh, there's all sorts of data, there's closed data, there's open data. Open data is the thing I was talking about. Typically, the same sources generate closed and open data. The only thing is that open data is liberated after often a period or after anonymization, uh, and it's quite frequent. Uh, there is a wide variety of licenses. So if you are using that data, the fact that it's on the web doesn't mean you can necessarily use it. Okay, this is important to bear in mind. Typically, data comes with a license. You have to read that license to see what you can do with the data. And also, as we have seen abundantly with COVID, there's a wide variety of data quality. Uh, and so this is something also to be aware of. And just to give you an example, because a lot of people are not aware of those, um, 
uh, I've highlighted here a few uh, Canadian ent level entities, but then also supranational entities that have an open data portal. So for instance, if you click on the data uh, for Winnipeg, uh, you get the City of Winnipeg open data portal, and there's a lot of things in there. I'll just uh, highlight some work that uh, we used uh, for instance, uh, where was this? Um, okay, there's a lot, as you can see. Uh, I'm going to have trouble finding it. Um, library, parks and open spaces. Uh, okay, I should search for it. So, tree. That's it. So just as, a, as an illustration, uh, the city of Winnipeg, which is not the most massive uh, organization in Canada, has this uh, list of trees on its uh, public property um, that uh, details all the trees in uh, public space in the city. There's about 300,000 records, tells you what tree, uh, where the tree is, what type of tree it is, and etc. Uh, so here, for example, I'll zoom in uh, uh, close to where I live, where, where is it that I live in this area. <laughs> uh, and you can see these are the trees on my street that are going to be very small. Uh, so if I look at this tree, I get an info that uh, this is a green ash. Uh, it has a diameter at breast height of 31 centimeters. So a diameter at breast height is breast height and 31 centimeters, it's a tree about this big, uh, up this big. Uh, so it's not a very big tree, but you see you have uh, the X and Y location. We did some work on Dutch elm disease uh, using this data uh, with elms, of course. Uh, so these are, these are openly accessible data and you have the same type of data for for instance some provinces have an open data portal the government of canada has an open data portal europe has an open data portal the un the who and the world bank which are important sources of data so from this you can get a lot of background information you're not necessarily going to get disease information from this but you are going to be able to get a good grip on the context in which you operate. Okay, uh, let me skip this. There's a bunch of uh, methods for picking up data. And let me just give you an example, a very simple example, the population of Canada. So suppose I wanted to plot the population of Canada. Uh, this is done through an R package called World Bank Stats. I'm going to use World Bank data. So the World Bank has tens of thousands of data sets available. Uh, so you can search for them. Uh, here, I actually assume, uh, by the way, this is a function that you will find in the repo. Uh, it's a set of functions that allow you to do some stuff with the uh, files and etc. I've, I've put some useful functions there. Uh, so this is just saying source this function as well, uh, this uh, file as well. Then what I'm doing is I'm using wb underscore data, which is a function to gather the data. I'm saying, okay, uh, get me Canada. Uh, C-A-N is the free uh, ISO, ISO 8166 dash free uh, name for Canada. Uh, this is the name of the indicator that I want, which is the po total population. Okay. I want the 100 most recent values. They don't have a 100. But I say, give me a hundred and it will give me as much as it has. And this is just a thing about the format. And then these are, uh, this is using a function uh, here that is part of this useful function thing is to make the axes uh, human readable. Because if you, by default, um, uh, R has ugly axes. And so I've made a function uh, for myself. Uh, that makes the axes readable. And so all of this, I mean, the command itself to get the data on the Canadian population is just this one line. Okay, well, two lines because I have to load the library. All the rest is just preparing a plot. And so what I'm doing is I'm plotting things and then I'm cropping the figure, which is another function that I have in this useful functions. 
and the result is this. Uh, so the data in the World Bank is since the 1960s only. And you can see my function has Transform these e to the seven, etc., notation into uh, millions. Uh, so the population rose from a bit under 20 million in 1960 to uh, close to 30, 40 million now. Okay. Another aspect is what's called data wrangling. And I'll also spend very little time on this and point out that you will find examples in my code. Uh, data wrangling is the fact that when you incorporate data from a source, you often have to put it in a form that is of convenient for whatever uh, purpose you have. Uh, so I come, I spent years using SQL, uh, uh, the um, uh, database language, essentially. Uh, and so for me, SQL is more natural. Uh, and if you have knowledge of SQL, then there's this very nice SQL DF uh, library, which is DF is data frame. It's a data structure, like it's the most common data structure in, in R. And so SQL DF allows you to treat data, uh, data frames, which are uh, sort of tables, essentially uh, improved tables, uh, like if with um, SQL functions. Or you can use the more modern approach, which is to use Deployer. Okay. Whatever you do, doesn't matter. You can choose. Here I'm giving uh, examples to show how you can do things uh, from well, using the different ways. Uh, I should point out this is not, I don't think I have it in data. Well, I don't know. It probably works. Uh, but I will check. Uh, so this is SARS-CoV-1 data, and I want to select Canada. And here I'm explaining several ways you can do that. Again, that code is available online. Uh, I'm not going to spend some time this, uh, describing it. Here, what I'm taking is I'm taking the incidence. Uh, I need, uh, so I, I want to plot the incidence. And interestingly, the package that I'm using cannot understand, uh, well, you have to give it the number of new cases per day. So here what I'm doing, the data that I have is not new cases per day, but cumulative incidents. And so I have to deconstruct that data, that's data wrangling. I have to deconstruct that data and make it into a number of new cases per day. Uh, and then I'm doing some stuff and I'm going to use a function called epicurve, uh, which is the only one that I'm using in this whole uh, presentation where I haven't managed to, to change the color of the background. All the others you will see, uh, all the plots I have here, there's an option to say black background, which will give you the type of figures you've seen. And if you say black background equals false, it will give you a white background image. Uh, but this one is the only one that I could not make into a black background, but this is showing you SARS-CoV-1 incidents in Canada at the beginning. Uh, and this is done using uh, what I was just showing you. Now, let me move on to uh, solving ODEs numerically. And that's important because uh, that's what we're doing in this uh, the first examples I show you were about ODEs. Um, and let me very briefly uh, detail this. So first of all, I'm going to uh, come back to the slide that I already uh, mentioned, well, showed for some uh, part of it, which was uh, that the D solve library that we're going to use, I really want to point out that this is not our programming language. It's, it's Fortran and C. And it's very old, very solid, robust programming language. Uh, so ODE pack uh, is uh, Fortran 77. Uh, and it started at Lawrence Livermore National Lab Laboratory, which is a place that did fantastic numerical simulations uh, in the 70s. So this, you're using tried and proved methods. Um, so there's a help that you can look at. Uh, the idea is always the same for ODEs, uh, whether you're using MATLAB or uh, Python or etc. 
essentially what you have to do is create the right hand side function and that right hand side function returns the value of the derivative or derivatives if you have a system of your vector field at a given point in space and potentially time okay it has to depend on time state and perhaps parameters. Um, I won't spend a lot of time explaining this, but let me just point out that it, on top of that, it's quite neat because you can use named variables. So X here is my state. And so here, my state, uh, this is the logistic equation. Okay. I'm passing parameters using the list P. So I'm using a list for the parameters. I could use a vector as well, but as I mentioned earlier, it's best to use a list because I can just say, well, K is P star K. R is P star R. Okay, I don't have to remember that R comes first or second in my vector. I just name them. And so here you can see I've, I've used also this command with as list X so what it's doing here is if I do this here, when I create my initial condition, I'm saying I'm naming the variables. Okay, n, which is my variable, my state variable, here there's a single one, and I'm saying n is 50. So my initial condition, by saying that the initial condition is like this, when I pass this argument to this with as list x, it deconstructs x and just says follow the components in x. So here there's only n, but for example, if I did an SIS model, as I'm going to do in a second, I could have S and I. Okay, so this allows me to not have to say use the first component in the vector x. The reason why I have n is because I have this. And I could use, and I should point out, I think I have it actually maybe in the next slide or uh, yes, actually, so let me not mention this yet and I'll come back to this in the next slide. Okay, so I have my right hand side. I call the library, of course, so this will only need to be done once in a given uh, session. I define my right hand side and I say that the result is a list. And in that list, I'm going to put the value computed for each of the derivatives. Make my parameters. I make them a list, initial conditions, times, and with R and this solver, uh, typically you impose the times at which you want your solution. So here I'm saying re return uh, the solution at times zero to a hundred by steps of one. If I wanted a finer grid, I would take steps of 0.05 or something like this. Okay. And solving is then just a matter of calling a function, ODE, with the initial conditions, the time over which the integration takes place, the function that I'm using for my right-hand side, and the parameters. Okay. So just a remark, uh, I was uh, saying before, I can also add P to my with as list. And if I add P, then I don't even need the P dollar, provided I don't have the same names in X and P. So don't name your state variables like your parameters, which is always a good thing to do. Provided I don't have the same names in X and P, it will know that N is a state variable that's part of X and R is um, a variable or well, a parameter that's part of uh, P, okay? So when I do that, I can write the equation very classically as Rn on minus n over k. Same thing as before. Um, oh, we get this. Uh, the default method for uh, ODE for uh, for ODE is L soda. Uh, L soda is an interesting method. Uh, it switches automatically between stiff and non-stiff methods. So if if it detects that your problem is stiff. Not going to go into the details, uh, but that means the integration is a bit tricky. Uh, it will s uh, switch to a stiff method and otherwise it will relax and go non stiff. You have a variety of other methods that are available to you. Okay. 
Uh, so LSODE, LSODS, it does delay equations, it does simple uh, PDs as well. It has the uh, OD45 and OD23 that you know from MATLAB if you've done MATLAB before. And actually, I should point out, if you're a numerical uh, person and you're interested in using, I don't know, uh, things like... Uh, uh, methods that preserve the properties of uh, of uh, systems. Uh, this is a type of numerical uh, methods that are very much in interest these days. Uh, well, you could write your method. Okay, it has to be compatible. It's a bit. It's not trivial uh, undo, uh, doing, but. That means that if you write your method, you write the code in Fortran, in C, in whatever you want, uh, and uh, make it available to the method, then the method will be able to use whatever integration method you have. Let me show you uh, an example. And here, there's an example I should point out uh, that I have as a file. I'll just mention the fitting of data. I'll just mention that what I'm going to discuss in a second here. I think it's important for the rest of the course because that might come in useful. But at the same time, I'm showing you a very simple uh, idea. I recommend taking a look at a uh, paper by Rhoda, for example, a paper by Porte. Uh, for more elaborate methods. So here I'm being super simple. Um, I'll grab some uh, epi data and I'll fit an SIR model to it. And I'm not going to show you the run. Uh, as I said, the code is in there. You can uh, you can play it. Uh, the idea um, is uh, basic fitting. And one point that I want to make is be careful when you're fitting. Uh, let's, that's a whole course in itself, uh, but uh, there are issues with fitting that come from what is uh, called non-identifiability problems, uh, which if you recall, I discussed at the, in the intro course, I discussed um, uh, compartmental models, well, the previous course, uh, compartmental models, and the problem of identification in compartmental models has been studied since the 70s. It's, it's known, oftentimes in epidemiology, we reinvent the wheel, and so um, it's become quite probant as a problem to have during the pandemic, but I mean, just know that these are considerations that people have had for quite some time. Uh, but anyway, um, so what's the principle of fitting data? Well, essentially, you have a data set that consists of points in time and uh, points in, sp in space, I mean, in the sense of uh, uh, state space. Um, those points can be vectors, okay? They can be a set of values, not just a single value. But essentially, you have a point uh, in time and a corresponding point in space. And what you want to do is fit here I'm talking about an SIR model, but you could fit whatever you want. Uh, the idea is that I have a solution to my SIR model. And I have some parameters for my model. And what I want to do is I want to minimize the error between the value that I get for my state if I solve the differential equation and the value in the data for the same variables. So if I take some norm, typically we'll take the Euclidean norm, but you could take another norm. Uh, I take some norm, I take the sum of this, this gives me the error that I get from using that particular point in parameter space. So that particular set of parameter values, uh, I get an error. And what I want to do is minimize this error. So I'm not going to go into details, okay? So here, what are the yi's and the x of ti's? In, if you think of epi data, typically we have incidents, so the number of new cases. And this is something I discussed uh, in the previous lecture. So we have the number of new cases per unit time, and in the model, that's beta si or beta si over n. Okay, it is not i of t. i of t is prevalence. So if I want to fit incidence data to uh, to a model, what I have to think about is, uh, you know, let's say I have mass action incidence and the Euclidean norm, what I need to do is to check what that value is 
over a small time interval, okay, that's important, um, minus the value that I've checked. Or if I have standard incidence, I have something like this. Okay, This is the most basic way. If you think about it, I should probably integrate over one day or whatever reporting period I have because this is what is happening at that particular time ti but unless I've made it clear that I'm going from ti minus one to ti I might be missing some stuff but that at least gives you a, something you can use um, and in practice uh, actually the name has changed but I will adapt the link when you're looking at the slides you can uh, look at this and uh, see that. Now the second part that I want to talk about is simulation of uh, stochastic systems and that's continuous time Markov chains. And so I've got a bunch of uh, uh, things on this that I want to discuss. That's going to take a little while. I think these, this lecture is going to be close to two hours. I'll try to uh, not uh, blabber on too long, but uh, I think that's an important problem. So uh, the first one, uh, the first thing I want to say is why uh, why study stochasticity? Why why uh, do this? And I, I want to point out that the method I'm giving you today, if you've written an ODE model, it's very, very easy to do what I'm going to show you. And that's the reason why I'm showing it to you, okay? and also explaining why I think it's important. Uh, but it's, I, let, let, let me get to this, okay? So first of all, why do we have stochastic systems? When essentially, when you think about any of the processes that you're looking at, uh, there's enormous numbers of interactions that happen in the processes that we're thinking of, okay? Disease first propagates within the person and then it propagates from within a person to another person. Well, within a single person already, there's a high degree of heterogeneity and there's a lot of processes that happen. And each one of the processes that takes place within a person or between people, etc., there's cause for error, okay? There are errors happen all the time because something doesn't work quite the way it, normally does but something is missed um etc so uh i here i have an example which i probably should change if you meet another human you forget to shake their hands i should say you forget to not shake their hands so for instance where we are talking about the, the propagation of a disease from people to people and we're recommending to people that they isolate but for some reason you meet X that you uh, haven't seen for a while and you shake their hand and maybe uh, that is a different from usually and so there's a s uncertainty that arises from the repetition of these processes and their mistakes and stochastic systems they incorporate this uncertainty so I'm going to uh, run with a SIS model. I'm going to look at the same type of SIS model I was looking at in the previous lecture. I'm going to assume there's a constant population P star and that the basic reproduction number is beta over gamma over times P star, okay? Uh, that means I'm looking at a mass action uh, type incidence. Now, what we've seen in yesterday's lecture, I mean, I'll call it yesterday because I've taped it yesterday, no, the day before yesterday, actually, uh, but uh, the previous lecture. So what we saw is that if I have an SIS model of the type that I was describing, uh, then what happens is that if I have my R0 less than 1, the disease dies out. We go to a disease-free equilibrium, whereas if R0 is larger than 1, the disease becomes established in the population, becomes endemic, and the endemic level is determined by this uh, value here, which is 1 minus 1 over R0 times P star. Okay. And in the examples that follow, what I'm going to show you is an SIS model with, I'm going to take a total population of 100, just to stay in the small numbers, okay? Uh, take a gamma of 1 fifth, so that means the average time between uh, before recovery 
uh, once you're infected is five days. I am going to vary our zeros within a bunch of values, okay? And I'm going to take beta. I, I don't specify a value of beta. I specify a value of R0, okay? I take the value of R0 that's indicated here, and I deduce beta from the equation for R0, okay? And then I take one initial number of infection. So when... I'm looking at a deterministic system, R0 rules this whole thing, okay? As I said, if R0 is less than one, uh, I'm going to zero. If R0 is larger than one, I'm going to an endemic equilibrium, which is equal to one minus one over R0 times P star. And this is exactly what you see in this graph, okay? I've taken R0 equals 0.8. I start with one infectious. After a while, the number of infectious goes to zero the limit, okay? Uh, or if I take R0 equals to 1.5, I go to about 30 something, I don't know exactly. Well, I've computed uh, the, the big fat dots here are the computed value of the equilibrium that I'm plotting, okay? And if R0 is 2.5, I go to this higher endemic level. Remember the total population is 60. Uh, so here this means that on average at any given instant, I have 60% of the population that's bearing the disease and the 40% remaining are susceptible and they're changing all the time. Okay, so that's the deterministic model. Now, if I look at a continuous time Markov chain equivalent of this deterministic model, what I have is that that R0 rules the world becomes a little less strict. So here I've taken R0 equals to 1.5. And what you can see, uh, these are 50 realizations of the stochastic process SIS model living like this. Okay? And what you can see is there's a bunch of solutions that are seem to be going around. If you remember, the equilibrium when R0 is 1.5 for the deterministic system is about 30 something. And you can indeed see a bunch of solutions, I don't know how many, uh, that are oscillating roughly around this value of 30. Okay. But I've highlighted in blue here at the start a number of solutions that go extinct. So what's happening is the, the system starts and then crashes. And when there's no more infection, there's no more infection possible given how the model is formulated. And that means that the disease remains extinct for all times. So whereas in the ODE case, I was uh, like R0 really determined uh, what was happening in the stochastic case. And this is really the equivalent. I'll show you in a, in a moment. Uh, in that stochastic case, the situation is not quite as clear cut. And actually, if you look at the frequency uh, at which extinctions do happen in this model, uh, I've, oh, oh, I vary I0 and 1, 2. I haven't done that plot yet. The, you have the code for doing it. Uh, I'll point out it's a very long to run code. Uh, I'll come back to uh, the length. Uh, of that. What I'm showing you in the following slide is just the case I0 equals 1, okay? But I have and I've uploaded the data for 1, 2, 3, 5, and 10 initially infected individuals. And then I'm varying R0 from 0 0.5 to 3 by steps of 0.05. And for each value pair, so each value of I0 and each value of R0 as above, I'm running 500 simulations and I'm counting how many of these si simulations actually go extinct. So how many of them are blue curves as compared to white curves? And I'll point out, just in passing, that if I were to wait long enough, I know, and long enough can be very long, there's a property of uh, mark of chains and that chain uh, we say zero is an absorbing state in that chain okay 
because zero is an absorbing state and it's the only absorbing state with a probability of one, all solutions, all realizations will be absorbed. I don't, it could take a very long time for this to happen. But you see, if instead of 100, I had waited a lot more, then I would have seen a few more blue curves. It can take infinitely long time for this to happen. But in practice, I mean, not in practice, in theory, the probability that I will be absorbed at zero, well, at zero in this case, but the probability of being absorbed is one. But so in that case, that's why I mentioned the duration of the interval, because that duration is important. It, it is going to change things in practice. OK, so uh, let me show you the case for I0 equals 1. So here you can see I've got increasing values of R0 on the x-axis, and I've got the percentage of simulations, realizations, they're called, that show an extinction within that 100 days time limit that I'm looking at. And you can see that when R0 is less than 1, as can be expected, okay, so here I'm showing you R0 equals to 1.5. R0 equals less, uh, less than 1 is this situation in the deterministic case, okay, it's the blue curve. And we still expect the stochastic system to roughly work the same way. And you can see that especially because I'm starting with a low number of infectious initially as small as they can make it and not be zero. Okay, because my state is continuous, uh, discrete in this case. Time is continuous, but the state is discrete. So in that case, up to larger well, values of R0 close to one, uh, I always have extinction. And then when R0 becomes equal to one, I have mostly extinctions, but I have a few simulations that survive. These 500 simulations, they're still uh, running. And as R0 increases, of course, the proportion of simulations that do not go extinct within that time window that I'm considering increases, but there's still 20 to 30 percent when R0 equals to 3 that go extinct. And that is very, very different from what we observe in a deterministic model. And it has importance to consider this when you think about it, because think of COVID, for example. COVID is one gigantic realization from one process. It is not a bunch of epidemics. People often make the mistake of thinking these are a bunch of epidemics that are unrelated. They are not unrelated. This is a whole event that's been unfolding for close to three years now, that involves the entire system, the entire humanity. Because suppose you have a new wave arriving, if the immunity in a population is different from the immunity in another population, which is going to happen because in, sub in previous waves, we've had different life histories of the disease in those places. Well, the disease is not the same for these two new places if the immunity profile in the two places is different, okay? And every single time things vary. But the whole thing that we have is a single realization, okay? So ODEs, they're actually the mean, and I'll show you this uh, in a while, they, are, they approximate those continuous time Markov chains. But if you think about what's happening and underlying this whole process, we're most of the time we can't, I mean, it's not that we can't, we can derive very interesting generic properties from the ODEs. But we have to bear in mind that typically we only observe a single realization of a stochastic process. And the ODE works as the mean of a large number of realizations. And so in practice, what you're going to observe is more a CTNC, a continuous time Markov chain realization of a process than an ODE. So oftentimes the ODE will allow us some conclusions and will allow us to understand some generic processes, but you have to bear in mind that what you're 
every epidemic is a realization of a stochastic process and actually a lot of them are interrelated. As I was saying, COVID is one realization. We'd have to start everything again from the beginning to say we're doing a second realization of COVID. Everything that's been going on for the past two and a half years is one realization of one gigantic stochastic process. Okay, so taking the means over a large number of generalizations uh, of uh, realizations is not necessarily uh, good. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, continuous type Markov chains, I am not going to go into details. I, I just to want to point out how you can go from a OD to a continuous time Markov chain to get stochastic simulations. Um, and I mean, there's plenty of resources. I gave, I have some, some slides, for example, but there's far from the only thing. Uh, I have some slides for a course that I gave, which has much more detail on this. Um, you'll find a variety of sources on this. A continuous time Markov chain uh, is almost a stochastic equivalent to an ODE. And in fact, there is a result that says that if you have a linear OD, the uh, OD is the mean of an infinite number of realizations of the corresponding continuous time Markov chain. Okay, so I can, if I have a linear OD, if it's not linear, there are some discrepancies that have to be accounted for. But if it's linear, I have a perfect match. If I take an infinite number of realizations of my uh, continuous time Markov chain, I, my corresponding ODE fits precisely with the solution of the Markov chain. Okay. So this is very interesting because all the properties you establish for the ODEs, you can use some of them. So when we're computing R0, the R0 we compute is valid both for the ODE and the continuous time Markov chain. Okay, so there, there are some very close ties, but the advantage of the Markov chain is that it allows you to incorporate this stochasticity. Okay. It's super simple to convert an ODE to a Markov chain. So, um, yeah, let me skip this. Uh, Markov chains, they can be formulated in several ways. Uh, typically, the good way of doing it is as infinitesimal uh, transition probabilities, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, but otherwise, you can also formulate them as branching processes sometimes, or in terms of time to the next event, which is essentially the stochastic simulation algorithm. Okay, so time is in R+. Plus. It's a continuous variable. On the other hand, state is usually, it could be continuous, but typically one of the advantages of this method as well is that it is discrete space. So let me show you a simple birth and death process. I'll come back to that in a second, actually. But uh, this is just to show you the infinitesimal probability uh, notation. So essentially you're saying that the probability of moving from j to i, um, from i to j, sorry, from i to j, i to j, uh, over the time interval delta t is the probability that I'm in i of t equals little i at time t, and I'm in, at time t plus delta t should be here, plus delta t, I'm in state j, and if I'm looking at an infinitesimal probability, I'm assuming that, okay, there's a birth rate, bi. And that means, okay, so here j is i plus 1. So that means I've increased my population by 1. Or I have death and I decrease my population by 1. Or I don't do anything. And that goes with this little O of delta T. Okay, it's one minus the probability that something happens plus the little O. And everything else is also disappearing on the order of little O. Okay. And so that's the infinitesimal uh, the, the formulation of them. So in this case, a mark, uh, birth death uh, process. Okay, so and we suppose that delta T goes to zero. 
So essentially, you're assuming that only one thing can happen in each time uh, interval. So how do we convert? Uh, very quickly, uh, it is easy as pie. Uh, the idea is that you focus on something different. In an OD, you're looking at flows in and out of compartments. Okay, so you have arrows going, uh, you take your flow diagram and you have arrows going into the uh, compartments and going out. In a continuous time Markov chain, you focus on the arrows. So I'm illustrating this here. Uh, oh, this is uh, another one of those weird inclusions. So let's take the SIS model with no demography. Uh, suppose that it's uh, SIS and uh, no demography, it's just beta SI, risk of infection, gamma I, uh, recovery. If I'm thinking of an ODE, this should not be visible. I don't know why the black part is visible here. Um, if I'm thinking of ODEs, I have my S compartment, and what I say is S increase, uh, increases through inflows and decreases through outflows. Okay, so from the point of view of S, this is a gain. So the derivative of S is going to increase with that rate and decrease with that rate. And likewise, the derivative of I is increasing with that rate, because this is a gain, and decreasing with that rate. Now, if I want to take this uh, continuous time Markov chain equivalent of this, all I have to do is I forget the states but I mean, I don't entirely forget them, but I sort of forget the states and I focus on the arrows. And the arrows, in this case, there's only two. So when I'm thinking in terms of the states for my ODE, I'm repeating each process because every time I mass balance inflows and outflows. Okay, so S prime is minus beta SI plus gamma I. I prime is beta SI minus gamma I. So every arrow, essentially, is listed as many times as it is connected to a compartment. Whereas in a continuous time Markov chain, this is one possible trans transition. Okay. And that transition is going to do what? It's going to add one infectious to the population and remove an S from the population. And the other possible transition is from I to S. And that transition does what? It removes an I and makes an S. So in terms of what is possible, the SIS demo without demography, the transition could be from S, I lose one S and I gain one I, which corresponds to a new infection. This happens with the rate or weight beta SI, exactly like before, okay? And the other transition is I gain an I and I lose, uh, sorry, I gain an S and I lose an I. Okay. And so in this case, I have recovery. The weight is gamma I. And if I'm thinking about the probability that these events happen, well, they happen with probability, the weight divided by the sum of all weights. So let me show you another example. Suppose I'm taking an SIS with demography this time. I'm adding both at the constant per capita rate, uh, not per capita, at the constant rate B. I'm adding death of susceptible and infectious and the infection process is as before. So both creates a new infectious, a new susceptible, sorry. Doesn't change I. So typically in a Markov chain, we would only list things that change. Okay, so birth is just, I'm adding an S, I remains constant. Death of a susceptible is removal of an S, infectious remain constant. I can have a new infection, which is the same as before, same weight as before. I can have death of an infectious, which removes an I and doesn't touch S, or I can have recovery. And the weights are the ones that I right over my arrows when I'm writing the ODE, okay? It's exactly the same thing as before. The weights are just B, DS, DI, beta SI, and gamma I. 
and the probability of each of these events is simply the weight of that event divided by the sum of the weights of all the events. Okay. It is not more complicated than this. Let me show you the uh, Kermack and McKendrick SIR model. Uh, in that one, we don't have, uh, so we have uh, S decreases by one and increases I, that's a new infection, weight beta SI, or removal, I said recovery, I should say removal, uh, removal is I remove an I and I gain an R. Okay, so here the states, the SIS model had states S and I. This one is the same transitions essentially, except that I have an extra compartment uh, state, uh, which is R. Okay, but the probabilities are the same as before. So how do we simulate this thing? In theory, first. In theory, we use uh, typically, but there are other ways, but that's the most well-known and the easiest, uh, Gillespie's algorithm. So it's, uh, it's also called the simu uh, stochastic simulation algorithm. It was derived in 76 by Gillespie, who's a f who was, he, he passed away a few years ago, uh, who was a physicist. And what it does is it generates possible solutions for a continuous time Markov chains. And those solutions have, uh, they're, they're correct in the sense of uh, their, uh, their probabilistic and statistical uh, properties. Okay, so it's a simulation algorithm. Of course, if I have a, a continuous time Markov chain or any type of mark, uh, process, I know that every realization has to be different. Okay, but what's important here is this algorithm generates realizations that have the properties that we expect of the solutions of the realizations of a continuous time Markov chain. So how does it work? If I have a system that has a state X and starts in an initial condition, X of T zero equals X zero. And then we have propensity functions and propensity functions are what I called weights before. Okay. Uh, there, so that's the terminology of Gillespie. A propensity function would be this. Okay these functions weights uh, and these are propensity functions for elementary reactions. Then we set the state, the time as the initial time, the state as the initial state. And while the time is in the uh, sort of times we want to consider, okay, that would be the final time we want to simulate for. What we do is the following. We take this variable psi t, it's dependent on t in the sense that every single time the value might be different. And in that psi t, we store the sum of the propensity functions computed at the state at time t. And I'll, I mean, this is the theoretic way of doing it. I'll show it to you in an example in a second. This psi t we have, we use it to draw a time and that time t is a random variable that's exponentially distributed with parameter that psi t. Okay, so this is important. This means, and tau t is going to be the next time. So what this says is that the inter-event time, the time between the, the present situation and the next time the system does something, switches, okay, uh, that's exponentially distributed, and that exponential distribution is based on the cumulative weight of all the events that I can take place, okay. So that gives me the time of the next event, and then I need to determine what the next event is, and for that I can take uh, that zeta t in uh, uniform uh, to zero one, okay, so a uniformly distributed random number between zero and one, and I find the smallest r such that the weight of the events, the cumulative weight of the events to uh, that point 
is greater than this zeta t times the total cumulative weight. Okay, so that's zeta t times psi t. I'll show you that again. I mean, it sounds a little complex, but I'll show it to you in, in practice in a second. Um, and then we affect the reaction. So that's the reaction that we've chosen. Okay, we found an index R for the reaction that took place. We affect that reaction. So for example, if in the SIS model, if the reaction is infection, then I'm going to increase the number of infectious. And then we affect the time change. So that means that new state that I have is now T plus tau T. And let me show you, oh yes, before we go on, uh, I'll just very briefly detail. If you don't have a good generator for that E, uh, the exponential distribution, you can use this little trick that allows you to generate an exponential distribution from a uniformly uh, distributed value in 0, 1. Uh, but okay, let's look at the SIS model. It's an important thing. So I start and I'm going to use, remember the SIS model, total population is conserved, so I can look at only the I equation. And that's what I'm doing here. Okay, I'm forgetting the S, I'm just remembering that S is P star minus I, and that's how I would construct my S. So I set my initial time, I set my initial number of infectious, and while the time is not uh, larger than my final time, I draw at random from this. This is beta S I, okay? The S, remember I said I don't need to know what S is, I know it's P star minus I, so this is beta S I plus gamma I. This is the weight of all possible events. Uh, I should say, little i is capital I here, okay? So uh, this is just a way of writing. Um, I then draw a time at random from an exponential distribution with parameter x, uh, xi t. And then I make this vector, and you can see these are the cumulative uh, probabilities, essentially. Okay? Because if I put this is beta si, that's the weight of the, the first event. And here I've only got two events, okay? Uh, and the sum of the weight of these two events is this. So if I take beta Si, and then I take beta Si plus gamma I, the last thing here is zero, uh, is one, sorry. Okay, so here I've essentially got the probability of this happening, and this is one. So if I'm smaller than this, when I take a number at random between 0 and 1, if it's smaller than beta si over xi t, it's the first event that took place. And if it's between beta si uh, over xi t and xi t over xi t, it's the second event that took place. Okay, so once I have that, I can determine which of the two events took place. And depending on which event took place, I can have either a new infection, which means that I'm increasing the number of infectious, or I have an end of infectious period, okay? And in which case I'm decreasing the number of infectious. And then I integrate, I in, uh, iterate my T, uh, and that's it. Now, let me show you when things can go bad. And it's very easy to find things where, uh, situations where this algorithm goes uh, bad, really bad, or bad. Um, so the inter-event time that I was describing, okay, it's exponentially distributed. If you recall, an exponential distribution with parameter theta has mean 1 over theta. So that means that when my psi t here becomes very large, the inter-event time might become very small because the average time between events is given by the mean of this uh, at a given time step, okay? And the average time between events is going to be one over psi t. If psi t is large, this is bad, okay? Let me show you this. And, okay, there's a birth death process. I'll check that this is indeed the name of the file still, but I've integrated, I've put it there. Uh, it's a bit the same model as I was showing you earlier, except that I'm making it super simple. I've got a birth rate per capita B, I've got a death rate D, and I'm using a classic Gillespie. So the algorithm is 
following, set the times and the numbers to what I want them to do. The sum of the weight of the events is Bn plus Dn, so B plus Dn. I draw my next time from this exponentially distributed random variable, and then I make my vector here and I decide which event occurred depending on the event that occurred. I either have a birth or a death and then I increment my time. Okay, so in code, this is what it looks like. I'm setting a value for the birth rate, a value for the death rate, a value for the initial time, typically will take zero, of course, a value for the initial population, um, and then I'm going to store my result in a vector t and n. Okay, t is going to be the times, and n is going to be the states, and I'm going to say, okay, I'll integrate for a thousand days. Uh, and this is a little trick. I'll, I'll track the current time and state. I could also look at the end point of my vector t and n, but just for simplicity, I'll do this. While the time is less than the final time, I define my psi t to be the sum of b plus d times the current state, n. Uh, there is one thing, so... Uh, here, if a population ends up very, very small, or zero, it's going to break the exponential generator. So I just check if the current population is zero, I break. That means I just stop this procedure. Okay. Because I've reached zero, I'm absorbed. I have no more, in fact, uh, no more uh, population uh, numbers in my population. And because birth depends on numbers, I can stop there. Then I compute my tau by using this as a random exponential. I want one value, and that value is generated at the rate xi t that I've just computed. The current time is now the, what it was plus that time step that I've just computed. I make my vector of weights. I find which interval this guy is in and I need to add one because it starts at zero. Okay, so zero, uh, I want one to be the first possibility and two the second. And instead of that, it finds zero or one. So I'm adding one to the solution. And depending on pause, pause so if pause is one, I have a birth. And if pause is two, I have a death. Okay, I update my state. Okay, I'm just adding one entry at the end of my vector of n's, which is my state, and I'm adding one t at the end of my current vector of times. Okay, so and at the end of this run, I'm going to have a bunch of uh, values of n and t. And let me show you, uh, and just in passing, what the ODE would be in this case. If I'm looking at this, n prime is b minus d n. And so we know that the solutions to this is, are going to be either b equals d and the population rec uh, remains constant because n prime is then zero, or b is greater than d and then we have n prime is equal to some constant, positive constant times n, so population explodes, goes to infinity, or b minus d is negative, so b is smaller than d, the death rate is larger than the birth rate, and in that case, the population collapses. Okay. So here I've taken the situation where the population remains constant, and what you can see, I've, I've materialized the, my initial step, which was 100, and so what you can see is that the population oscillates uh, randomly, roughly around that 100. If I take a much higher, I mean twice, uh, a higher death rate than a birth rate, what is happening is I start at 100 and then progressively, you see, I, I wanted to go to 1,000, but actually I reached the value zero before I even made it to 400. And at that point, because of that uh, break I had, I am exiting my simulation. Okay. Now suppose that instead of having b uh, smaller than d, as in the previous case, I had b larger than d. So from the ODE, we expect we have n prime equals b minus d, which is positive, 
times n, so we know that we have an exponential solution, and this is what we observe here, okay? You can see that the population starts at one, uh, 100, sorry, and then rises and rises up to a large value. One thing that you can see here is that the simulation here stops around a little before 350. Now, contrary to the previous case I was showing you, so here the simulation stopped at about the same time, actually, uh, but it stopped because uh, I hit that breakpoint. Uh, I hit n equals zero, and therefore I came out of the loop uh, because I know that from then on it will always be zero. Here, I stopped. Why? Because I got tired of waiting. So I wanted a thousand time units, but in practice, I interrupted in the graph I'm showing you, I interrupted at 344 and a bit because I lost patience. Um, and when I interrupted the code, what was happening is that the value of n was about 100,000. So that's the total population. Remember, I started from 100 and now I'm at 100,000. Uh, and the size of the vector, the length of the vector, uh, was 208,000. And likewise, t uh, was also 208,000 because those two vectors are exactly the same size. And what I observed in that case was that time was moving very slowly, which I'm showing you here at the bottom. So diff returns the element by element difference it's like a discrete derivative, okay? It's a difference between one entry in a vector and the next one. And so here, what I'm doing is I'm showing you the tail, the end of that vector. So that's the five last vector values in that 208,000 things. And so you can see that the time difference between events Okay, so because remember, these are the times at which the events occur. The time between these events was of the order of 1 to the minus 5, 1 to the minus 4, etc. So these are very small. Imagine if I have something like this, it means I need 10 uh, to the 5 steps to cover one time unit, one day. Okay, And this is what I'm showing you here. So I'm showing this diff here, the inter-event time, as a function of the time during the simulation. So at the beginning, I have an inter-event time that's essentially reasonable, okay? I can see that, okay, it's suppose it's essentially living somewhere here in this meme. So at the beginning, it's between 0.2 and 0.6 days between each event. Okay, birth or death, I don't know, but uh, every time I have about 0.6 day, I can even go up to one day here at that point. I, uh, I made a step forward of one day. Uh, but then as time progresses and the weight of events, uh, the total weight of events, because the total population is increasing, there's the total weight of the potential events is increasing likewise, and that means that the inter-event time goes to zero. Okay, and you can see this is the uh, experimental inter-event time that I'm seeing here, and you can see that it decreases and decreases and decreases. And that means I'm stuck. Okay? But uh, in practice, we resolve this by uh, using uh, packages. Okay, uh, so tau leaping uh, is an approximation method that was uh, proposed by Gillespie as well, actually, actually uh, and others, uh, but to sort of alleviate this problem of uh, inter-event times going to zero. And the idea is that, okay, so first of all, I should point out, this is an approximation method. So... In the previous instance, we were looking at a Gillespie, a, a typical Gillespie, we'll call exact Gillespie, and that Gillespie produces results that are uh, exact in the sense that they have the characteristics we want of 
realizations of a continuous time Markov chain. A tau leaping method is an approximation method, so you, you're not exact anymore. But the advantage of tau leaps, and there's a, a variety of other techniques that have been developed as well, but the advantage of tau leap is that it allows you to uh, consider groups of events, essentially. I mean, it's a, it's a method for making sure that time moves forward when you're doing a Gillespie. Whoops. When I roll my mouse, uh, pages change. Um, so the good thing is that uh, the two most used packages for simulating uh, Markov chains, continuous time Markov chains, are Gillespie SSA2 and Adaptive Tau, and both of them have uh, tau leaping. They do things a bit differently. Sometimes uh, Gillespie SSA2 is better. Sometimes adaptive tau is better, but you will sort of learn that when you try to use them. Um, so how would we simulate this in this case? Well, it's quite simple. So I just load the library. I set my initial conditions the same way as I did for the ODEs. It's important. I mean, it's useful to name things. Okay. So here I'm setting my initial conditions and I'm saying in my initial conditions, the S is this and the I is this, which means that when I'm doing these reactions later, I actually just need to name as I did in the initial conditions and the parameters as I name the parameters. Okay, so this is a list of reactions. It's simply the list of arrows uh, that I was explaining before. Okay, so this is the simple SIS. So it's simply beta SI, beta SI, that's the rate at which things happen. Okay, and that consequence of this is to lower the S by one and increase the I by one. And that's a new infection. I'm just giving it a name. It's useful sometimes to have a tag uh, to know what a, what event took place. Uh, then this is a recovery. And uh, I, I'm setting a seed. So if you want to do reproducible code, you might have to set seeds. Okay, so here I'm setting a seed and what that does is that it allows me, I mean, see, here I'm setting seed null, so I'm not, I, I have no interest in reproducing. But if you set a value for the seed, you could take C equals two or something like this, then the random number generator will always produce random numbers in the same order. So that can be good to check that your code is running. And now you call the stochastic simulation algorithm uh, by saying, okay, I've got an initial state. I'm using the reactions that I've defined here. My parameters are as I define them here. And by the way, uh, note that these, uh, they carry through from my simulations before. Okay, that's why I'm, I haven't detailed this. Um, and then I'm specifying that I want to use the SSA exact which means use the proper Gillespie, not a tau leap. And finally, that's my, my final time. Oops. And when I do that, I get my solution. And I can, uh, my solution has several fields. And so you can see there's a one that's called time. Uh, and then there's state. And that's the list of the various states. So there's, of course, going to be S and I, but I'm just plotting the S. Okay. And so this is... Uh, the prevalence through time for one simulation. Okay. And so I'm saying one simulation. I showed you a graph earlier with 50. Let me, uh, let me sort of finish this uh, lecture by pointing out uh, what the benefit is in learning how to parallelize your code. So uh, the parallelization is very simple. And uh, there's an example here that I've put on the GitHub that you can uh, access from this link. Um, you'll need to use, this is not done in this piece of code I'm showing you, but it's done in this, uh, this whole script, uh, load the library parallel. 
and parallel gives you a bunch of functions. One of them is, for instance, this one, which detects the number of cores that you have in your machine. It says cores, but it's actually the threads that it detects because a lot of times now uh, you have uh, so, for example, this machine that I'm uh, that I'm recording this on is uh, my biggest machine. It's got 64 cores and 128 uh, threads, so twice the number of threads. Uh, some recent Intel processors have something like eight cores and 12 threads. So, what R will detect here is the number of threads, not the number of cores. Okay, although the function says detect cores. So here, uh, this is just a benefit of being uh, having access to a great machine with one I'm on. It has 128 threads. Unfortunately, R doesn't know how to deal with 128 threads. Uh, so if you have more, if you have more than 124 or 126, I recommend doing something like this because otherwise you'll have a problem. Okay. I should point out, this is uh, the instruction here makes a cluster on this number of cores. So here, for example, if I run this on this machine, it would say, OK, I've got 124 cores, make a cluster with 124 cores. You can make things more evolved. Uh, I should really point this out. So there is a way to uh to use several machines okay instead of just the one that i'm working on i can use uh, however number of cores on different machines this is slightly more complicated to set up and i'm not showing you this here what i'm showing you is how to run this on the 12 cores that you have on your laptop or 16 that's quite common now or on your desktop uh, not on a bunch of different machines so i make a cluster with a number of cores i export some values this is simply because you have to think of each worker they're called workers so i'm going to have 124 workers in this case or you'd have eight or ten or whatever uh, each worker needs to be able to have the information that it needs in order to do its work and here for instance i need to have defined my parameters this is the parameters that i'm using here for instance okay because when I'm calling the function, it ends up being called with this. So I'll need to export this. Okay. I also need uh, to export the function that the workers will need to use. So it's, it's, very, it's quite simple, actually. So when you're devising your code, you start without uh, the cluster export or the cluster eval queue uh, commands. And when you run your code, in parallel, it will report that it doesn't know function X or function Y. And that's when you start populating this, okay, by saying, okay, so if, it, if the workers report that they are not aware of what param is, then I need to cluster export it. That's how I typically proceed. Okay. And now I've got this code that just runs one simulation of the uh, stochastic, uh, uh, the uh, continuous time Markov chain. And I simply call it, and that's why I was insisting earlier on the fact that it's really useful to know how to use par L, uh, L apply, because to do the same thing as L apply does, but to a, uh, in a parallel fashion, all I need to do is use at this instead of a lowercase l apply i use lowercase par then l apply and that runs in parallel on the cluster that you have defined okay so this is what cluster here i've made my cluster i've ported things to the cluster and uh and this is where i'm running my par l apply okay. and this is what i get uh before I comment on this uh, slide, let me go uh, further and uh, just show you the conclusion 
uh, first of this. Uh, so when I run this code that I just showed you, uh, and uh, I'm using this to time precisely the time spent in different parts of my code. You put this command uh, tick, or you can load the library, but this is just saying, just use this function and this function from the library, okay? Uh, so if you put this command tick before the block of code you want to time and talk after the block of code, it will return something like this. 4.70 something sec uh, seconds elapsed. That's between the end. Okay, should point out one thing. I'm being a little devious here. Uh, so let me let me continue commenting this, and then I'll come back to explain one thing. Uh, and then if I do the same thing in parallel, in uh, not in parallel. Look, I'm doing the same command, but instead of parallel apply, I'm using l apply, which is sequential. So it's doing everything in order. Um, then it takes 158 seconds. So because I was able to run 50 simulations in parallel, essentially I've speeded up the process 33 times. Now I said I was being a little sneaky because I did exactly what I wrote here in the parallel code as well. Okay, I put my TikTok tick just before the call to parallel apply and my talk just after the call to parallel apply. It turns out that this face can be quite lengthy. Okay, so if you're doing, for example, for me, if I'm doing 124 calls, it takes a while because this is not done in parallel. It can take up to 20 seconds to make the cluster or even a bit more okay sometimes it will take a while to set up the cluster what's important though is that if i have a large number of simulations the gain is in the simulation time okay i will lose half a minute there but if i'm running 10 hours of computation what what would be 10 hours of computation in uh in real time and that I divide these 10 hours by 33, then there is a definite gain. So uh, parallel computation is probably not worth it for a small computation, one that runs quickly. If it's less than 30 seconds, it's probably not worth the trouble, although it's not too much of a trouble, but you might actually spend more time setting up your cluster than doing the actual computation. On the other hand, as soon as you're talking minutes or hours of computations, parallel computing is going to really speed things up. Okay. And the last thing I want to do is to spend a little time discussing this figure because it shows something that I've alluded to earlier, uh, but I think it's really important. So here I'm showing you 50 simulations, uh, the results of 50 simulations. So, and then I'm showing you as well in blue, the result of simulating the OD SIS model with exactly the same parameters. In gold, I'm showing you the mean of all the simulations that I'm running, including those that go to zero. And in red, I'm showing you the mean of all simulations that do not go to zero. So I condition on not becoming extinct over this time period. So all these simulations here that end up at zero, I forget them in this curve. I just look at, um, at the ones that don't go extinct. And here, okay, before I do anything else, let me explain how I get these mean curves, because they are not simple. If you think about it, the inter-event time in these uh, models, they are exponentially distributed, they're, they're random variables. So no two realizations, and here I have 50, no two of these 50 realizations have had their switches happen at the same instant. Okay, this is not possible. Uh, 
uh, it's a random process. Therefore, every one of these situa simulations, these realizations, they have a different time axis there at the bottom. That time axis is not the same for each one of them. So how do I compute a mean? Well, the way to do, a simple way to do it, there are several ways to do it, but a simple way to do it is to interpolate. So what you can do is you can set a very fine time grid here. So for example, I typically do, uh, if I remember well, I use 100 time points per day. That makes it very precise, okay? So every day is 100 time points. And then what I do is I interpolate each of the solutions I get over this time grid. So my each one of my solutions is actually prescribed at these 100 time points per time unit. Uh, and then I can just sum all the values at each of these time points and divide by whatever to get my mean. Okay. So this is how you can get uh, these values for these unequally spaced time points. Now, really the thing that I want to conclude this lecture on is by how pointing out how close these blue and red curves are to each other. And this was my point earlier, that an ODE and a CTNC, they are very, very similar. And if you do your approximation well, your continuous time Markov chain in this case, conditioned on non-extinction, will very much track your ODE. Okay? There's going to be some discrepancy that's due to the fact that these are non-linear processes. And as I said, the matching will be exact only in the linear case. But still, if uh, here I'm only doing 50 simulations. If I did 500 and I took the mean conditioned on non-extinction, then that it would be much better already, okay? And that's one of the advantages. And that's why I always recommend that when you're simulating your models, if there, there are cases where the ODE tells you all you want to know. But you can see one thing that this thing is doing, this continuous time Markov chain is doing, that the ODE is not. It's showing uh, some variation. And if you think about the ODE, the processes, they, they, they have no variance here. Whereas here, I can see how much difference uh, this, solution, this solution has around this mean, okay? And this is a notion of the variance. And also there's this problem that I mentioned earlier of the fact that actually the R0 being bigger than one, uh, this is R0 equals 1.5. Uh, R0 being bigger than 1 doesn't necessarily mean that the solutions are going to go to an endemic equilibrium because some of them might go extinct. And being able to consider that process, uh, that, that characteristic on top of the sort of mean characteristics that you get from the ODE is, I think, one of the reasons why it can be interesting to use continuous time Markov chains.